Welcome to Resurrection Life of Jesus Church in Sacramento, California. Each week, these messages are brought to you with practical help for daily living from our teacher and pastor, John S. Terrell. Our hope is that you'll be encouraged and challenged by this message, and that you'll share it with a friend. This morning, Pastor John continues this series entitled, The World's Money System. The Bible points out that it is the Jewish people who will be used by Satan to run and manage the Antichrist system. Most Christians have some kind of knowledge of the history of Israel from Abraham to the time of Christ, but few know what has happened in the last 2,000 years. The Kabbalistic Jewish leadership decided to change their strategy after three violent uprisings failed to regain control of Israel, and ultimately the world by military power. Their new policy would focus on trade and banking, which would give them control over the world's money systems. This week we will examine the rise and fall of the Khazar Empire and the Fuggers, the first global family which controlled the Roman Catholic Church, the Holy Roman Empire, Spain, England, and predated the Rothschild dynasty by some 350 years. Join us in this epic journey from 66 AD until 1550 and find out how the past affects our future. This message is entitled, The First Century to the Fugger Family. Now, let's go to the sanctuary and join Pastor John as he begins today's message. Praise God and welcome to Resurrection Life of Jesus Church on January the 2nd, 2011. And I'm glad to be able to come your way today and bring a message that will be probably a very difficult message for many people to receive, and, uh, but it is a necessity. If you want to be ready, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. That's the book of Revelation, the 13th chapter. And uh, we're going to pick it up in verse number 1 here today. So let's stand right now for prayer. My Heavenly Father, I want to thank you and praise you right now that on January the 2nd, 2011, I can stand in this pulpit and we are webcasting around the world. Father God, help me today to be precise, to Lord bring the message out in such a way that it is understood. Be no misunderstandings. And I thank you right now for your anointing upon me and anointing upon everyone listening. And this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. The message I'm going to bring out today is going to be unbelievable to many people. And I want to illustrate this, that if you and I would travel to China today, and uh, we would ask a young Chinese person anywhere from 10 years and up to about 20, what do you know about Tiananmen Square in Beijing? What do you know about it? Oh, they would say it's a nice place, a parade place, and so on. If I would ask them, what happened in 1989 at Tiananmen Square? And they would say, nothing. Almost half a million people or more had gathered the Tiananmen Square for more than a week protesting against the communist regime. And in Europe, East Germany had fallen. A number of East European nations had thrown the communists off. And the communist rulers in China decided to squash it. Tens of thousands of people were crushed by tanks. And they brought in troops. They, couldn't, they did not dare to use troops that were from the Beijing area, because they had friends there. So they brought them in from the outlying areas. And then the killing started. 
But today, if you go to China and you want to talk about it, they simply say it does not exist because the press, the radio, TV, books in China says it doesn't exist. Have you ever thought about this? Darwin and his evolution theory, not facts. If you today want to be a professor in biology or some other fields at a university in America, they will ask this question, are you willing to teach evolution? And if you say, no, I'm a creationist, I will not, I don't believe in that, you cannot get that job. You can't get a job as a professor at the university or college unless you adhere to Darwin. Who was Darwin? A British Jew? Didn't believe in God? And created a fairy tale that man became become out of a slime pit someplace with a lot of flashing and things. We have been brainwashed to believe in evolution. That's what you were taught in school. And God had the person that stood up and said, I don't believe in that. Now, I'm going to give you truth today that has been refuted, but it is true. When God selected Abraham, so did the devil. And we actually in the world have Two parallel lines running. The Messiah from God and the Messiah from the devil. There are two tracks of Messiahs. From God and from the devil. If you turn now to Revelation chapter 13. And we read here the first few verses here because I really want to make a strong point here. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth and the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, the devil, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And as so one of his head is were wounded to death, his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, and they worshipped the devil, which gave power to the beast. They worshipped the beast and said, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? There was given to him a mouth speaking great things, and blasphemies and power was given to him to continue for in two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, <clears throat> to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and then they dwelt in heaven. It was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are written in the book of life of the Lamb slain for the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. I believe the Bible. I believe there's going to be a world government, a world federation coming someday when a man serving Satan will control the entire earth. The Bible tells us that. Now, if you think, that means that there got to be a preparation time. All of us remember reading about the Soviet Union. And uh, some people think, well, you know, the Soviet Union began in 1917. Wrong. The foundation for the Soviet Union was laid 1848. When we had Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels write the Communist Manifesto and the book Das Kapital. 
The writings in 1848 was used to prepare a group of people that simply jumped on Russia and caused the Russian or the communist revolution. How about Adolf Hitler? Well, Adolf Hitler, he didn't come in power just overnight. It was also the writings of Karl Marx that also created for the Nazis. And it was a preparation time. Here's what I'm telling you now. There's a long-term planning. And we're going to look upon it now. Everything is documented. We can still get a documentation today. But you've got to learn to understand that what I'm teaching you today will, in years to come, means a death sentence. Just like if you stand up in China today and say, there was a massacre at the Tiananmen Square in 1989, they will send you to the gallows. If you speak this years from now, the same thing. In the previous message, we established the theology of the Antichrist system. And we also established now that the system is a Jewish system. This does not mean I'm anti-Semitic. It simply means that we have a Jewish leadership that are in the Antichrist, actually they are the Antichrist system. The Jewish rabbinical system was taken over by the Kabbalistic Jews as early as 700 years before Christ. And their damnable teaching destroyed the moral fiber of the people and led them to idol worship. Turn to me to Isaiah chapter 59. That's Isaiah the 59th chapter. And this is written about 700 years before Christ. It's Isaiah chapter 59. And you pick it up in verse number one. Remember what I talked to you last week. The Kabbalah teaches to sin is to serve God. The more you sin, the more you serve God. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that he cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongues have uttered perverseness. None calls for justice, nor any pleads for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. 700 years before Christ, the Kabbalah had totally taken over Judah. They hatch, cockatrice eggs, weave the spider's web. He that eats of their eggs dies, and that which is crushed breaks out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in a path. The way of peace they know not. There is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked path. Whosoever goes therein shall not know peace. The destruction of morality was absolutely total in Israel. Let me mention these points to you right now to see where we are in America. In the beginning of the century, America went to war 
with Spain. So we could take Cuba and the Philippines. Probably most of you have not know your history. You haven't told the history. But the United States Navy had sent their ship to the harbor in Havana, the Maine. And guess what? We wanted a fight. So our intelligence service blew up the ship and then screamed, bloody murder, hit the Spain Spaniards. That's how we started that war. Nice and convenient. Let me take you back now to World War I a few years up. The people of the United States, we don't want to get involved in the war, World War I. The world government said, absolutely, you should. So here's what we did. We sent passenger ships, and we had passengers, and we had military cargo to the British, knowing that the Germans had warned us, saying, don't send any armament, we will sink it. We even notify the Germans we are coming with a ship, the Lusitania. And the Germans sank it, and the cry went up, go to war! Fast forward, 1941. There was a huge movement in the United States of staying out of World War II. A huge movement. So the United States government were told, fix something. So they simply put together all the battleships that we had, put them into Pearl Harbor, moved all the aircraft carriers out that were hidden outside the islands. And then we invited the Japanese, matter of fact, they were teased to come in. And the Japanese that were coming in, our radar picked them up. Officers heard her up and simply told, ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. We want to sacrifice. More than 3,000 American sailors died in Pearl Harbor. And the cry went up, war. This is how Satan works. Deception, lies, and deception over and over again. Why are we in Iraq? Why are we in Afghanistan? Doesn't secure our security here, but we are at war. The Jews were captured by the leadership, the Kabbalistic Jews were captured by Satan. If you read now in verse number 9, Therefore is judgment far from us, neither is justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity, for brightness, but we walk in darkness. That's how it is today in America. We group for the wall like the blind, and we group as we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday, as in the night. We are in a desolate place of dead men. We roar all like bears, and mourn sorrow, soar like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but it's far off from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord, and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving uttering from the heart words of falsehood. And judgment is turned away backward, and justice stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth fails, and he that departs from evil, make himself a prey. And the Lord saw it and displeased him, that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered 
that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. Jesus Christ himself had to settle things. You that are here today in this room, you that are watching us, listening to us, you are a globalist. You and I are globalists. Quickly turn to Matthew chapter 28. There's a bonus scripture. That's Matthew, the 28th chapter. And you pick it up in verse number 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Christianity is a global religion. Jesus wants to reach every nation in the world. He wants to reach all of them. And so does the devil. The Kabbalists have their Messiah, the serpent. They are determined to bring the serpent to the earth and to set up their kingdom. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. It's spiritual. Someday we have a thousand-year kingdom, but we don't have it now. There's a battle between the two groups following the Messiah, the false Messiah, the Antichrist, and the true Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, creating the Messiah kingdom through the sword. I have listed here the wars that the Kabbalistic Jews tried to do. Satan simply enticed them with a sword to take control of the land. The Maccabean, Maccabean era from 200 to 150 B.C. And I wrote below here that you find this in a sermon I preached 1176, which was called Biblical Truth Concerning the State of Israel Waiting for the Messiah. The Maccabean era was a very strong fighting time. But the Jews lost. They had semi-independence from about 140 to 63 when the Romans came in and occupied Palestine. In 66 AD, a revolt broke out. The Jews were strong. They were pushing back the Romans. But four years later, they were killed and slaughtered as the Roman legions marched in. You have that in these outlines. You can find them on the website. There's also a video on the website for it. Then you have something that most people do not know. The Diaspora Rebellion from 73 to 117. If you look upon a map that you have in the very back, and this is a map that is taken from Jewish sources, and this shows the population of Jews at the time of Christ. Two and a half million Jews lived in Judea, Galilee. One million lived in Egypt. One hundred thousand lived up in Cyrene. One million lived in Babylon. And one million lived between Antioch and what is Turkey. And then you had a hundred thousand Jews that lived in Rome. The Jews in Egypt and serene, start a revolt. And to begin with, they were successful. But after a while, they were defeated, and a terrible slaughter took place. 
There's going to be one more of racing. And it was Simon Bar Kokba. They rose up against Rome in 132 AD and said, I'm the Messiah. And they retook Jerusalem, drove the Romans out, started worshiping on the temple ground again. But in 135 AD, Simon's remaining forces fled to the small town of Betar, southwest of Jerusalem. The Jews were able to hold the city for several weeks, but Roman spies found a secret way to the city. And once inside, the Romans saw the raging hatred for the Jews was evident. Because Simon bar Kokhba, his soldiers all killed. According to Solomon Grazel, 580,000 Jewish soldiers were killed. That's how many they had mustered. 580,000. 10,000 civilians were slaughtered by the Romans. And a large number of Jews were gathered up and shipped to the slave markets in Rome and other cities. The Jewish leadership realized now that with military power, we are not able to take the land. We can't do it. They tried it four times, and there was a policy shift. I'm not going to read it right now, but in Ezekiel and in the book of Isaiah, it talks about Satan. And Satan is a master of trade and banking. And the policy shift policy shift was that Satan simply said this, I'm going to have my people infiltrate every nation in the world, and I'm going to get control of the finances. Whoever controls the finances controls the politics of that nation. Trade and banking was a road that Satan took. Several classes of Jews developed now. You've got to understand now, the majority of the Jewish people are poor, uneducated. This is how they were. And they had no idea what was going to happen. There was a core group of Kabbalistic Jews that were running the program. Let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 2. The book of Acts, chapter 2. And I want to pick it up in verse number 5. The book of Acts 2, 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, a multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in, his, in our own tongue where we were born? Parsians, Medes, Elamites that dwelt in Mesopotamia, in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt, in parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. These were the traders and the bankers at this time. These were wealthy Jews that lived in all these different places, and they would come to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, and then they would go back and live again. Kabbalistic rabbis were fighting Orthodox rabbis, and the Jewish people ended up in different religious groups. 
the merchant and the bankers gravitated toward the Kabbalistic leadership, while the poor and under the Jews stayed with the Orthodox teaching. Many Jews in different places of the world would declare themselves to be the Messiah for the next 1,900 years and will gather Jewish people who believe them. Hundreds of Jews during the last 1,900 years rose up and said, I'm the Messiah. And they died, and it was not so. In 325 AD, when Christianity had become a state religion in the Roman Empire, the new rulers needed the skill of the Jews, who had by this time become established moneylenders and bankers. The Roman Catholic Church forbade the Christians to do the banking. The Jews said, we'd be glad to take care of it. Their language of Hebrew and the beginning of Yiddish became a private global language and gave them the advantage of being able to communicate with other Jewish traders and bankers regardless of where they lived. Have you ever wondered, why do we have Chinese Jews? Did you know that we have Chinese Jews? Did you know that communism, how did communism come to China? It came via Russia. And the communist leadership in China were Chinese Jews, Kabbalistic Jews. They run in the banking system in China today. They're in charge of the communist leadership. How is that possible? Well, from 325 and up, the Jews developed trade. Let me read here so I stay with the program so I don't deviate too far. Number two, the Kabbalah and the Talmud gave them a common religion which had its own codes and conducts. As a result, they had a global religious and law system which gave them a court system in which they could settle legal matters between themselves. Now, in the Talmud, it simply says this, if you have a Gentile, you can lie to him, you can cheat, you can steal from a Gentile, it's okay, he has no soul. But if you're dealing with another Jew, you've got to be truthful. They were able to retain their unique nationality because they refused to assimilate into the different nations and create a strong feeling of Jews versus Gentiles. I don't care where you go today. If you go to any nation, you have X number of Jews living in that nation. And they speak the language, but they don't mix. And you look at them, what are they doing? Well, they are in the banking, they are in newspapers, they are in uh, television, media, Whatever this leadership in either banking or communication, you find Kabbalistic Jews in every nation. You have the World Jewish Congress. You have the American Jewish Congress, the South American Jewish Congress, Canadian Jewish Congress, African Jewish Congress, European Jewish Congress, Banai Brith. There's a number of organizations that are global around that the average Christian have never even heard about. You don't even know it, and that's how they want it. Now, during the reign of the Frankish kings, goods were moved from the European Christian nations, and Naples and Palermo, which at that time were controlled by the Muslims, and Jewish traders had their own fleet. Jewish merchants, known as Radhanites, traveled through Europe, the Middle East, and the Far East, all the way to China between the 6th and 10th centuries, trading in spices, silks, coins, and jewels. 
Now, I, per I have a lot of Jewish books, but I purchased particularly a huge Jewish history book. I paid over $150 for this. And this particular book, very huge, simply gave me the rest of the stuff I didn't have as I pieced this together. What I'm teaching you now is not from Nazi material, right-wingers, identity movement. I'm telling you things from Jewish sources. That's all I use. I will never use a Nazi source. I will never use an identity source. I go to the Jewish writings. I don't want to have any spots on me. I want to simply bring out the truth as it is. Now, the trade routes began in Rhone Valley, which is in the southern France, and they ended up all over Africa, Asia at that time. And so what happened is that Jews stopped off in India, they stopped off in China and so on, and over time they married women locally, so the white Jews that came over to China took on looking just like a Chinese, just like you have Jews in Ethiopia. They are black over the years that they intermarried, but they maintained their faith. And this is why we don't have any Eskimo Jews. They never went up to the Eskimos. I thought about that. Now, what they developed was this. We talk about money now. System of letters and credit and bills were developed to, to simply replace the coins. So what they did was this. They would simply go to a king and says, okay, uh, I want a letter from you, a credit letter, that you are going to put up so much gold. And then they took that letter to another place and said, hey, you know, I got this gold here. Can you take this letter and give me goods for the letter? And they took the letter, and they got the goods, and eventually the, the gold would transfer back and forth. That's how they started, and eventually became money like we know it, cash. As a result, Jewish enclaves of traders and bankers were established in many nations, including China. And they were protected by the national governments because they were beneficial to the local national economy. But remember this now. The poor Jews were always persecuted. They were slaughtered. But the rich Jews never had any problem because they were beneficial to the Gentiles. Let's talk about the Kassars now. And uh, what is the Kassar? Well, it was a Kind of people, it's a mixture of Turks, Persians, and Mongols. And this empire began about 500 AD. And if you have a map and you look upon a map in your mind, you have the Black Sea, you have the Caspian Sea, you get the mountain right to the south down to Iran, and above that and into Russia was the Khazar Empire. And they became very powerful. And they conquered quite a big chunk of Ukraine and Russia. And 700 powerful empires there. They had Jewish merchants and bankers. And the emperor of Kessaria simply said this. I'm going to become Jewish. He looked at the three religions. He looked at Christianity. He looked at Islam. He looked at, Ju at, at Judaism. He said, Judaism is the original religion. Islam come out of it. Christianity come out of it. I'm going to be a Jew. Now, kings in those years, they simply made a decree from now on at such a time and date, we all convert. So the decree was made. Kassars, we are now becoming Jews. They brought in Rabbis, they set up synagogues, and for the next 300 years, the Khazars became devout Jews. Then the empire fell apart. 
And the Khazars were pushed up into Poland, Russia, and Eastern Europe. And most of the Jewish people living, coming from Russia and Poland and Eastern Europe are descendants of the Khazars. They are not descendants of Abraham. There is no bloodline. And most of the American Jews in the Hollywood area, media, television, newspapers, are Khazar Jews. Those are what they are. Matter of fact, the Zionist movement is a Khazar movement. On page four now, we're talking about consolidating power. About 1300, the Kabbalistic Jewish leadership simply said this. We now have an immense amount of gold. We have established trade and banking in all the different nations. And Satan said, now I need... I need now a front man. I need someone that can be for the public to see. You see, the Kabbalistic Jews are not going to say, we are going to run the world up. They're going to put a front organization out. And they selected a man in Germany by the name of Hans Fugger, F-U-G-G-E-R, and simply said, this man is going to be a prototype. He's going to control the finances in Europe. Now, if you take, let's say that you have some money. If you need to lend money to the United States government, you've got to have a lot of money for them to borrow from you. And the Fugger family... In no time at all, and I just want to read a couple of things here for my outline. The Kabbalistic leadership had access to the wealth, accumulated by Jewish traders and bankers. It did not take long for the Fugger fam to have access to large sums of money that they gave enormous loans to the emperors, Maximilian I and Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. How can a guy, a family, start loaning money to emperors? This gave rise to the Roman Catholic Church selling indulgences. Now, indulgences was a Jewish idea. And they sold it to the Roman Catholic Church, saying this. You can make a lot of money by simply telling people that they can be forgiven of their sins for money, indulgences. So that was a common practice. This is one of the things that Martin Luther was against. And as in the Catholic Church, you know, the priest simply would say, well, you know, uh, for $50, we can forgive you everything. For $25, we forgive you some things. $10, we can forgive you a little bit less. And a lot of money flowed into the Catholic Church and ended up into the Fugger family. When a banker loans you money, you've got to remember this. If you loan you $1,000, he's going to take $3,000 back from you. Eventually, the Fugger family leased the Roman mint in Rome from the years 1508 to 1515. They ran the finances of the Roman Catholic Church. Today, the Freemasons run the church's finances in, in Rome. This gave the Fuggers control of the economy of the Roman Catholic Church for that period of time. Martin Luther thundered against his family, and they wanted him dead. When the king of Spain needed money to finance a voyage of Christopher Columbus, it was the Fugger family that loaned the money they financed Columbus. And guess what? As the Spanish soldiers looting, taking gold and silver from the Indians, where do you think that gold and silver ended up? Much of it ended up with the Fugger family. 
Both Ferdinand I and Philip II of Spain became heavily indebted to the Fugger family and granted them mining rights in Chile and Peru. The Fuggers also invested in the slave trade from Africa to the Americas. The Fugger family was the originator of slave trade to bring black people from Africa to Cuba first, South America, and later into the United States or the American colonies. By the time the Fugger family disintegrated and through mismanagement, they simply disappeared 1550. The Kabbalistic leadership had learned that there must be a succession that is controlled when building a wealthy family which by which they can tr control kings. As the Fugger family grew over the years, there was no central leadership left and the different branches of the family did not toe the political line set forth by the Kabbalistic leadership. The Rothschild family was selected 214 years later in 1764 to be the family that would bring financial control over the whole world. In Proverbs 29.2, we read this. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people mourn. Summarize this message here today. I want to say this. The book of Acts tells the story of Christianity developing into a global religion. There's never been written a work on the development of the satanic Messiah. No church leader has ever dared to write that history. No pastor today would even dare to speak like I'm doing. I'm taking a huge chance. Because most people now will simply say he's anti-Semitic. Because they've been brainwashed that we cannot look upon who is the Antichrist and who is propelling him to power. I begin in Revelation 13. I will close in Revelation 13. It's Revelation chapter 13 again. And I want to challenge you. Study out what I have spoken today and written. Take the time and say, I'm going to dig into this. If you can prove me wrong, I will publicly stand here and say, I am wrong. But you can never do that because the evidence is there for what I have spoken. Take it straight from Jewish sources. In Revelation 13, verse number 14, and deceives them that dwells on the earth by the means of those miracles which are power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, and it should make an image to the beast, which had a wound by a sword, and did live. Let me go back up to verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and caused all the earth and that dwelling to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. The false prophet. Now, I shared with you a few Sundays ago that in Sweden, in Stockholm, the Pentecostal leadership closed down two churches in the suburbs because these pastors refused to cooperate with a Roman Catholic church. I told you that. Well, the American Pentecostals are not a whole lot better. In New York, in the state of New York, right now in the city of New York, the Assembly of God District in New York padlocked a large Pentecostal church, Assembly of God Church, 
and locked the congregation out and took it over because they did not tow the political line of the Assemblies of God, which today is moving to what emerged with the Catholic Church. Did we see that on our national news television outlets? Of course not. It was shown on new, local news in New York. And this week, the congregation had to stand outside. They stripped the license for the pastor. And they stood outside and said, we will not bow down to the district. The whole church was locked out. The spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of the false prophet. Everybody today is, is getting into this. You know, we got to get together the Roman Catholics. We got to be nice to the Muslims. We got to love the Buddhists. And, you know, the Hindus are coming, you know. We got to be together. It's here. It's fast. But you see, the church does not have Knowledge. What do you think would happen in Russia if 1900, somebody could have come in with a time machine and laid out and showed the Soviet Union how it would be with all the killings? The Russian would have simply shot every Bolshevik, killed them. What do you think would happen if 1925 we could have gone to Germany and showed the German people what was going to happen with Hitler? They would have killed the Nazis. They would have never got into power. But the problem is this. People have no knowledge. They don't know. And because they don't know, we can't resist. And then just a few more things that are going to be done. And he had power to give life, verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand and the foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had a mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. I'm sorry, I read too fast. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had a mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, that him that is understanding count the number of the beast, which the number of a man, his number is 603 score and six. The number of the Kabbalah and the number of the Kabbalistic Jews. They are the ones that are going to bring us the Antichrist. What good does it do to have knowledge? Number one, you can pray. Number two, we can slow things down. And thirdly, we can simply bring people out from being deceived and not taking the mark. Because when the mark of the breeze comes, it will be operating through the churches. You will find it in your Assembly of God church, your nearest Baptist church, Presbyterian church, and all the different churches will simply have a station in the church where the pastor will say, you know, the Messiah is here. He has built the temple in Jerusalem. There is peace in the world. And the Jewish people finally got their temple. We are having international, inter-religious services. We have got together with everybody. There's such a peace. And to maintain this, let's be loyal to the Messiah. The man, the leader of the world. And let us worship him and take his mark because he is the son of God. Hear me now. The Kabbalistic Jews and their people are going to say they're going to call the Antichrist for the son of God. 
they're going to say he's fulfilling the promises given to the Jews years ago. They're not going to accept him as Satan, as a beast. They're going to accept him as a Messiah. And unless you and I have knowledge that there are two messianic lines and telling people this, they will be deceived. Now you go home, you think about this, you study this, you pray over this, look up the scriptures. And together, we're going to expose the Antichrist system. So they will not be able to sneak anything in. It will have to be done in the open. Let's stand for prayer. My Heavenly Father, how do I give an invitation after a message like this? Oh God, we have people here in our church today that maybe need a healing. Maybe they want to re-educate their lives, Lord. Maybe they want to be prayed for to have strength to stand in these last days. And Father God, I pray right now. Let your Holy Spirit minister to our people, Lord. And I thank you for that. And Father God, I pray for the people that watched us or listening to us. Some of them are not saved. Some of them are working agents for intelligence services. And I pray, Father God, for conviction. Let the people realize that Jesus Christ, born on Mary, the carpenter from Galilee, is the Son of God. He has come. He has died. He rose from the dead. He is the Messiah. Father God. Help people to see that and to accept the real Son of God today. If you watched and you're listening, just tell my Heavenly Father, forgive my sins. Jesus, I believe you're the Messiah. And I take you right now to be my Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins. Come on in, Jesus, and save me. In Jesus' name, and he will. Then write us, call us, but most of all, call on God. Read the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. The altars are open. The elders are here. Deaconess, if you have a need, come on up. Be anointed with oil and prayed for. May God bless you. You've been listening to Pastor John S. Terrell of Resurrection Life of Jesus Church in Sacramento, California. This message was the third part in the series, The World's Money System, and was entitled, First Century to the Fugger Family. The Bible points out that it is the Jewish people who will be used by Satan to run and manage the Antichrist system. The Kabbalistic Jewish leadership decided to change their strategy after three violent uprisings failed to regain control of Israel by military power. Their new policy focused upon trade and banking which gave them control over the world's money systems. Pastor John looked at the rise and fall of the Khazara Empire and the Fuggers, the first global family which controlled the Roman Catholic Church, the Holy Roman Empire, Spain, England, and predated the Rothschild dynasty by some 350 years. This 14th century family disintegrated and a large portion of their wealth was lost through mismanagement, but their past still affects our future. Do you have an ear to hear with? This message is available on cassette, CD, and DVD. When ordering, ask for sermon number 1271. There are several ways to contact our ministry. 
you can visit our website at eaec.org. There you can learn more about Pastor Terrell's ministry, read insightful articles, and explore the online store. The web address once again is eaec.org. If you prefer to write, address your envelope to Resurrection Life of Jesus Church, Post Office Box 166, Sheridan, California, 95681. That's Post Office Box 166, Sheridan, California, 95681. If you prefer to call us, the toll-free number in the United States is 1-888-708-3232. That's 888-708-3232. For calls from outside the U.S., the number is 916-944-3724. That's 916-944-3724. Resurrection Life of Jesus Church is sponsored by European American Evangelistic Crusades, and this has been a production of EAEC. Thanks for joining us today, and until next time, may God richly bless you as you read your Bible and walk with Him. Welcome to Resurrection Life of Jesus Church in Sacramento, California. Each week, these messages are brought to you with practical help for daily living from our teacher and pastor, John S. Terrell. Our hope is that you'll be encouraged and challenged by this message, and that you'll share it with a friend. This morning, Pastor John continues the series entitled, The World's Money System. Sabbatai Sevi proclaimed to be the Messiah in the year 1666, but unlike Jesus, he lived an immoral life and the Kabbalah teaches that through his sinful life and death through sickness, he opened the door for salvation for them that believe on him. It is completely the opposite of the New Testament account of Jesus, who was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and died on the cross for our sins. Pastor John points out that the Messiah concept found in the Kabbalah is actually Satan's gospel, and the core belief of the people in charge of the coming world government. If you don't understand this concept, you will be deceived by the Antichrist system and might even take the mark of the beast. This message is entitled, The Kabbalah. Now, let's go to the sanctuary and join Pastor John as he begins today's message. Praise the Lord and welcome to Resurrection Life with Jesus Church on January 9th, 2011. I'm glad that you're here today with us in the sanctuary, and I'm happy to have you with us that are cyber members. The message I'm going to bring out today is more of a teaching than a sermon. And um, some people say, you know, why do we need to know this about the religion of the Antichrist? And the reason is that... The religion of the Antichrist has seeped into our Christian churches and eventually will take over. And we need to know what's coming down the pipeline. And we need to know how to defend ourselves and how to push back and proclaim truth. Because truth is going to set people free. The material that I'm going to be presenting today is not taken from sources that are from Gentiles. I have over the years collected a number of Jewish writings, not from obscure people, but from the mainstream of Judaism and the Jewish people. And um, so this is the source that I'm using in my teaching. Now, I realize that I'm going to cover in about 58 minutes what it took the devil some 200 years to develop. And um, as I've been praying this week and weeks before, God simply told me this, that here's how this series is going to go down. We're going to produce a number of small booklets. And today, you should have received one of these. 
which is called the Kabbalah, the mother of all harlots. This is book number one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a lecture here today, like if you're in college, and uh, you will have a textbook that you can take home with you and then study this and get into the Word of God as you go through it. And I guarantee you that when you have this book in your hand, you will understand what I'm teaching today. If you're watching us right now, we do not have this up on the web. You can order this booklet from us, or book, the Kabbalah, the mother of all harlots. So having said that, let's stand and let's pray. My Heavenly Father, I thank you right now for your anointing to be upon me, Lord, as I'm going to deal with a very difficult subject. Let the anointing be upon each one listening. So that, Father God, we should be able to know the truth and be able to present it to people in the world. I thank you right now for a mighty move of your Holy Spirit, even if it is an ugly subject. And this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. I would like for you to turn with me in the Bible to a scripture verse, which is Revelation. That's the book of Revelation, chapter 13. Revelation, chapter 13. And um, by the way, we do have these books here today in the sanctuary. So uh, they didn't get handed out, but after the service, you can pick one up. And uh, we're not charging you for that today, so you can have one for free. In the book of Revelation now, chapter 13, we pick up in verse number 4. And this is in reference to the Antichrist. And they worshipped the dragon, that is Satan. And they worshipped Satan which gave power unto the beast of the Antichrist. And they worshipped the beast of the Antichrist, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? Most of the time we read this, we think about Satan worship. We think about Anton LeVay, he's dead now in hell. We think about people that are screwballs and so on. But Satan worship is not worshiping a guy with a pitchfork, horns in his head, and grinning from ear to ear. It is worship of Lucifer. And they claim him to be the beautiful. So I want to teach you today what Luciferian worship really is. When you look upon people worshiping the devil, they are just what you call in the fringes. They are on the outside. They, this is your, what you call disturbances. The real worship by Lucifer is done by very select few. And they are following what is called the Kabbalah. In your outline, I wrote this. There's going to be a long-term planning and development. And the question is, how are these events going to come into being? When is it going to happen? And can the development of this coming world system be spotted before it is fully here? Now, I want you to know this one thing. The Antichrist system is a mixture of finances, politics, and religion. Three ingredients. The Antichrist system cannot function without having total financial control. They also have to have total political control, and they have to have total religious control. It's a three-legged stool that they have built on, that Satan has built on. 
I gave you a few points here, and I'm just going to highlight them because this is a, a teaching that you're going to have to study yourself. A world dictator must have a loyal following that will believe in him as a person and the mission that he presents to them. These followers will not be located in just one area, but will be present in the nations of all the earth. They cannot be loyal to the national government where they live, but will be loyal to the international cause for which the world dictator stands. In other words, the followers of the Antichrist will be internationalists, not nationalists. They will have no allegiance to the, to the government in the country they live in. Secondly, the dictator's followers cannot be poor or unskilled. Poor people do not influence governments. Instead, it is the well-educated and well-to-do people who will hold positions that will enable them to be part of the government process and set the policies. So what I'm telling you now is this, that your riffraff that you see in the world, criminals and so on, they are not your shakers. We are talking about people that are educated, college degrees, doctor's degrees on top of that, people that are highly educated, very well to be with money. These are the people that are used by Satan. Third point, these loyal followers must be unified under the same religious persuasion which will galvanize efforts to enforce their rule and belief system upon the rest of the people in the world. What does that mean? It means that you have a family that is part of this. They will not send their children to public schools, but they have private schools. Now, if you travel to Switzerland, you will find some of the finest private schools in the world. They're not cheap. They have other locations. And to attend one of these schools, you're talking about maybe a cost of between $50,000 to $100,000 a year for a student. This is where the people that are loyal to the Antichrist system, this is where their children go to school. Fourthly, these followers be molded into an international force that will despise national governments except for their own. They will control all communication systems so that the information released will fit their agenda. As a result, they will control the news media, radio, television, and the printed word from the newspapers, magazines, and books. The entertainment industry will also be included because it is the largest educational system in the world. Let me repeat that. The entertainment industry is the largest educational institution in the world. And this is where they are educating people. All medical, point number five, and scientific research will be done under their control, including industrial research, so that nothing will be developed that is not beneficial to their system. The industry, if it is in chemistry, agriculture, manufacturing, is all controlled by these people. And they are simply only bringing out products that they want to have for their purposes. Let's talk about the cell phones and the electronic gadgets that we have not today. If you think about it, teenagers today are a cell phone. They cannot live without the cell phone. 
And teenagers today have no time to really exercise and do things. They are glued to their cell phones, their computers, their games, and so they are being mesmerized and simply taken away initiative to do something of their own. All banking, stock market, exchanges, bond markets, and the setting of worldwide interest rates will be under their control. And seventh, the loyal followers will become so powerful that any politician, businessman, educator, or industrial owner that does not submit to the program of a world di dictator will be destroyed immediately. Now, we saw last year several prominent media people. Helen Davis was once was a White House reporter for many years, and she was thought well thought of. She made one statement against Israel, and in two days she was fired, lost her credentials, thrown out, and she was simply labeled as a racist and anti-Semite. She was destroyed in two days. There's been other people on the Fox News Network and so on this week, and not this week, but last year, and they were destroyed immediately. Now, I want you to think about this. No politician will stand up and say anything negative about Israel. In the United States, in Western Europe, they do it, their life career is over. And then, lastly, and let me read this. Since they won't take control with military power, they must develop a chokehold on each nation that cannot be broken, and leaders who do not submit will be politically annihilated bankrupted or killed through fake suicides. If you go back the last 20 years, I can give you 20 American politicians, Senator Towers from Texas was one of them, and um, it's about 20 of them, and they died either in an airplane crash, they committed suicide, or they died of cancer or some other things, and they all had in common opposition to the state of Israel. Eighthly, they will create the number of secret brotherhoods whose members will be made up of those who are not loyal followers, but can be controlled through these secret organizations. This is where the Freemasons come in. Now, in Sacramento, we have the headquarters of the Masonic Lodges for California. And the Masonic Lodges in California had their own newspapers. They had their own communication system. And you will find that everybody from politicians to lawyers, judges, police chiefs, mayors, and so on, anyone has any statue in politics or in business is a member of a lodge or two lodges. You do not advance unless you're part of the system. Now, how far has the world government system developed, or this world dictators developed? All eight points are in place today. Once this is realized, logic should dictate there are dangers, that you and I are dangerous now to the loyal followers of the Antichrist, because the system they have is working in the dark, and they're trying to go over the world through stealth. And by us exposing light upon it, we are now becoming a threat. There will be two threats. There will be from Satan and the demons themselves, and there will be from people in high places. Therefore, the closer we come 
to the final takeover of the Antichrist system, the more persecution will be heaped upon anyone opposing the system. The Bible tells us that once the system is put in place, it will impose a death sentence on anyone opposing it. And we are almost there. We are getting very close to that time. The center now of Satan worship has to do with the Holy Serpent. I shared with you before, last week, that the Holy Serpent actually fell into the bottom's abyss. Let's just look at detail at a little bit here today. And uh, I'm quoting here from Professor Gershom Sholem, and I want to read to you from page number two. In the teaching of the Kabbalah, their God is introduced as having two aspects or countenances, one male and one female, the latter being known as a Shekinah. This God is referred to as the first cause, which was worshipped by Pharaoh, Nimrod, and the wise men of India alike, is not the concern of religion at all, for it has nothing to do with the affairs of the world or its creation, and exerts, exerts no influence on it for good or bad. But in other words, he's saying this God essence is not concerned about the world, is not involved in that. Now, let's just back up a little bit. About maybe five or six years ago, the push has been on to take out he in the Bible, all male references, and to put in she. Remember that in our churches? Where did it come from? It comes from the Kabbalah. And the average person in church is not aware of that. They think, well, that's just another stupid thing from the so-called liberals. No, it is not. It's the loyal followers that want to begin to introduce that God is a woman. This is what the loyal followers believe. Then we read the next statement here from Gershom Scholem. And by the way, Gershom Scholem was a professor at the University of the uh, Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He held the chair of the Kabbalah for many years. He is considered a scholar by Jews on the Kabbalah. This is not a lightweight. This is what he wrote. Another who found the passage to Esau was a source of Balaam. Now, you know who Esau was. He was rejected by God. Esau belongs to the realm of the good God, reversed, where the power of death is made not, and it is also the dwelling place of the virgin, she who is called Rachel in the biblical stories about Jacob, and is elsewhere known as a beautiful maiden who has no eyes. She it is who is a real Messiah, who cannot contradict to traditional opinion, be a man, and to her all the king's weapons are surrendered, for she is also the much sought after divine wisdom or Sophia, who is destined to take death place as one of the three rulers of the world. For the present, however, she is hidden in the castle and kept from the sight of all living creatures. Again, she is the holy serpent who guards the garden, and he who asked what the serpent was doing in paradise was simply betraying his ignorance. A lot of double talk. Now, if you go to Masonic Lodges, you read a book, Moral and Dogma by Albert Pike, you will find that they are rejecting Jacob, and they are embracing Esau the fallen one. Another thing you've got to understand is this, that the Kabbalists do not believe that the Messiah is a person. 
She is an essence. She is simply an essence that will show itself in different centuries to, through different men. Reincarnation. Now, why do you think the New Age movement is so strong? Because the New Age movement is giving a soft teaching of the Kabbalah. It's a soft teaching of the Kabbalah. I am now urging you, this little booklet that we are giving you today here in the sanctuary, the Kabbalah, the mother of all harlots, please pick up a copy. We're not selling it today. We're giving it to you. And go through this and read in detail all the things that I just kind of glanced over here right now this morning. I want to talk now about the Jewish Messiah, Sabbatai Sevi. Most people have never really heard about this man. And um, Sabbatai was a rabbi that lived in the 17th century. And he simply felt that he was the Messiah. Now, he was not unique. At the time of Christ, approximately 14 men, let me slow down, I want you to catch this now. At the time of Christ, 14 men prior to Jesus had risen up and said, I am the Messiah. Judas of Galilee was one of them. And they had all been killed, crucified. Jesus was not unique in this way. There were many messiahs prior to him. There has been many messiahs after him. But Sabbatai is the biggest of them. Now, Sabbatai was born in 1626 in the city of Smyrna, which is today located in Turkey. He was trained as a rabbi, and the goal, as he was a young man, he simply had a vision from an angel of light. Guess who came and saw him? Lucifer. And he was told that you are the Messiah. Remember now, last week I laid it down, that in the Old Testament we are told there will be a Messiah. We know that. We believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of Mary, was the Messiah. We believe that. We believe the Messiah has come, died, resurrected, and is today ruling from heaven. We believe that. Now, the Jewish people at the time of Christ, most of them rejected it, Hundreds of thousands received him. But the teaching in the Jewish synagogues, in the Talmud, is simply this. Mary was a whore. And she had sex with a Roman soldier. She got pregnant. And that was Jesus. And Jesus is a bastard that then claimed to be the Messiah. So that's why... Jewish young people abhor the name of Jesus because they told that from childhood, don't listen to what they say about Jesus. He was a bastard. His mom was a whore, and he died as a sinner. So when you talk to a Jew and you mention the name Jesus, that's the picture they get in our mind. So when we talk to Jewish people, we got to simply say, are you willing to look upon Yeshua, the Messiah, from a New Testament viewpoint? We got to take them through the New Testament and the Old Testament. So don't blame Jews and say, well, they're horrible people. That's what they are trained to believe. Now, this is what I wrote on page number four. And everything here now is in a booklet that I'm giving you today. According to Nathan, that was a false prophet now, 
There exists a certain relationship between the Messiah and the course of all those intrinsic processes of which I spoke in the last lecture. And then he has a symptom, Shivraya and Tikkun. In the beginning of the cosmic process, in Sof, the famous God withdrew his light into himself, and there arose the primal space in the center of in Sof in which all the worlds take birth. What does that mean? It simply means this. God is male and female. He withdrew in himself, created a space which became our universe. That's pantheism. They're simply saying that God is all in all things. Let me just read this paragraph here. I've got, I got to try to move a little faster. Symptom is a Hebrew word that originally means concentration, or contraction, but in the Kabbalah it means withdrawal or retreat. The Kabbalah teaches that God withdrew himself into himself, created an empty space where he could reveal himself as a creator. Shivara HaKelim is another Hebrew expression which refers to breaking of a vessel. In Sof is also Hebrew and means the infinite being. Tikkun is Hebrew means mending or restitution. Kabbalists believe that God will break himself as a vessel in due time by coming forth as a Messiah and restore all things to himself again by closing the empty space which he had created. I want you to see that this is a parallel. We know in the New Testament that God the Father God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is one, yet three. We know that redemption is God the Father reconciling himself through the Son to himself, through the Holy Spirit. The parallel between the Kabbalah and the faith of the Christian faith is very close. Then Shulman said, uh, Shulman said this on page four. The pri this primal space is full of formless, hylic forces, the Kelipath. The press of the world consists in giving shape to these formless forces, in making something out of them. As long as this has not been done, the primal space, and in particular its lower parts, is a stronghold of darkness and evil. In the depth of the great abyss, in which the demonic powers have their abode, when following the breaking of the vessels, some spark of divine light radiating from in self in order to create forms and shapes in a primeval space. Now let's stop right there. Let's talk about Darwin. Now Darwin is a, he believes in evolution. Darwin was a Kabbalistic Jew a powerful Kabbalistic Jew. How is it that 200 years, a Kabbalistic Jew in England can write up an evolution chart that today is a must in American colleges, universities, public schools in England, all over the world? If you do not believe in evolution and you try to be a teacher in public school, a professor, you are out. Where did he get it from? Sparks of divine light radiating from in self in order to create forms and shapes in the primal space fell into the abyss. So Darwin simply was very smart. He, this was a job he was asked to do. He wrote evolution, the theory of evolution, based upon the Kabbalah. Now you would think that professors, people with doctor's degrees and so on, they should you know, begin to think, where is this coming from? But I want to say this, that the educated leadership in the world today are stupefied. They are stupid. 
and Satan has blinded them. And then the Kabbalah also says this, now they spark you fell to the abyss, they also fell the soul of the Messiah, that's the essence now, which was embedded in that written of divine light. Since the beginning of creation, this soul had dwelt in the depth of the great abyss, held in prison of the Kelipath, the realm of darkness. Together with the most holy soul at the bottom of the abyss, there dwelt the serpents which torment and try to seduce it. Now, to these serpents, the holy serpent is given over, which is the Messiah. Only in a measure in which the process of the ticking of all the world brings about the selection of good and evil in the depth of primal space is the soul of the Messiah freed of its bondage. When the process of perfection on which the soul is at work in a prison and which it struggles with the serpent of dragons is completed, which, however, would not be the case before the end of the ticking, Generally, the soul of the Messiah would leave its person and reveal itself to the world in an earthly incarnation. Now, on the next page, I'm just going to highlight this. The Kabbalists decided now, as we shared with you last week, it's hard to make things good. It's easy to make them bad. So you have two points there. To destroy all evil on the earth and make it totally good, that is out, it didn't work for them. To destroy all good on the earth and make it totally evil. And this is exactly what the Kabbalists are trying to do right now, is to destroy all good on the earth and make it totally evil. And they are quoting here Psalms 119, 126, it is time for you, O Lord, to work, for they have made void the law. Psalm 1, 20, 19, 26. And I see it, 28, 21, which states, For the Lord shall rise up in the Mount Perizim. He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, and his strange act. Now, next week I'm going to be talking about Jacob Frank, what he developed. But Jacob Frank simply said this, that there's a belief in the necess- necessity of apostasy of the Messiah and the sacramental nature descent in the realm of the Kelipoth, and that the believer must not appear as he really is, and that the Torah cannot be observed. Instead, everything has to be broken. Let me now take it to the Sabbatai movement. And I want to share a few things with you about the Sabbatai. And I'm just going to highlight this. Now, we had two men. We had Sabbatai Sevai, and we had Nathan the prophet. Now, Nathan the prophet, he simply lived in Gaza, he was in Israel, what is today Israel, in Palestine at that time. And the job of Nathan was he had received a revelation. And I want you to understand now that this is very important. Nathan, the rabbi, moved in the supernatural. He claimed he had visions and was visited by a blessed soul from beyond, without a word, dead people visited him, who decided to initiate him into the secrets of the Kabbalah. He also claimed that at times he saw a pillar of fire, which spoke to him, and sometimes he would see a sight like a human face. He studied writings of Luria, which is not a rabbi a hundred years earlier, Kabbalistic man, and Sometimes he had visions that lasted for 24 hours where he saw light of the seven days of creation and he claimed a man could behold the whole cosmos through this order. According to Nathan, 
the moment he was convinced he was a prophet, he would usher in the coming side of Jews. According to Nathan, when he was in a vision, beholding a mystery of creation, he was shown the image of Sabbath I see by engraved on the throne of glory. So Nathan now lived in Gaza, had not met, he had not met Sabbatai, and supernaturally had his visions. In the charismatic moment that took off, we had signs speaking in tongues, healings, casting out of demons, and so on. Nathan was as charismatic, if I can use the term today, as Benny Hinn, and Benny Hinn into the third power. Now, Benny Hinn loves to throw away, throw his, you know, jacket, whatever it is, to slay people, you know. He gives all kind of prophecies that have never been fulfilled, and he's always slaying people. This is how Nathan operated. This is how he bamboozled the Jews at that time. He would come up with miracles. They would, people would fall down. He would prophesy with all kind of things. And they simply said, this must be a man of God. Remember the Jews seek a sign. And when they see a sign, they get excited. Nathan established himself as a prophet and begin to move in a supernatural gifts, almost what I would say charismatic gifts. Jews flocked to him so that the Spirit of God in Nathan could divulge the most inner secret and show them what kind of repentance they had to do to atone for their sins. Listen now, in the charismatic movement, you have people with a supernatural gift. They can simply stand before someone and say, you have this disease, you have that disease, and they can describe in detail their sicknesses. Nathan had this gift. He operated in that. Every gift of the Holy Spirit has been counterfeited in the Kabbalistic movement. Now, Nathan wrote letters, and they were sent all around the world to the Jewish colonies, and people begin to say, well, maybe something has happened. Remember now the year 1666, 666. And the, the Jewish Kabbalists said, in the year 666, the Messiah will come. Even the Catholics at this time believed that in 1666, the Messiah would come. So one day, Sabbatai traveled up from Egypt, and he met Nathan. Listen to this. It's in the book. When Sabbatai came to Nathan to seek repentance, because Sabbatai had a sin problem, Nathan fell to the ground and asked Sabbatai for forgiveness that he had not done homage earlier as Sabbatai had traveled through Gaza on a number of occasions. So now what happened is that Sabbatai was told, you don't have to repent. This is what Nathan told him. Sabbatai, you have a soul of a very high order, which need not to repent for your sins, because you are the Messiah. The proclamation was done a little bit later that year that Sabbatai now was the Messiah. And the Jewish rabbis in Gaza became believers that Sabbatai was the Messiah and the king of Israel and rendered special honor to Sabbatai. In the solemn assembly in the synagogue, Sabbatai chose 12 of the rabbinical scholars of God to represent the 12 tribes, copying what Jesus did, having 12 apostles. When he left Gaza, he was riding the horse with a man walking in front of him. Now, Sabbatai simply believed, now I am the Messiah. And he had a false prophet. Fast forward, 
book of Revelation, chapter 13. We're going to have the Antichrist, right? And we're going to have the false prophet. Two men working together. The false prophet simply bringing worship to the beast of the Antichrist. This is the prototype that Satan had done. This is what he was trying to do. Now, Sabbatai raised the standard of rebellion against the hallowed traditions in the law, and he simply said this, incest and fornication is the highest form of serving God. Parents, have sex with your children. Fornicate with everybody around you, and you are serving God. Now, there was resistance to Sabbatai. There was a number of rabbis who simply opposed him, but they were not strong enough. And thus, Sabbatai left Jerusalem in the month of Tammuz, which is June 1965, arrived in Aleppo, a large city of commerce in northern Syria, the 8th of Ab, or July 20th, 1665. The rabbis in Jerusalem said, Sabbatai, you are a phony. And when Sabbatai left Jerusalem, he stood outside and he cursed it. What did Jesus do when they were leading him up to the cross? Before, he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have wanted to gather you up as a hen and redeemed you. And you would not. He wept over Jerusalem. Sabbatai cursed it. Now, people, as they met Sabbatai, they were excited. They would fall to the ground slain in the spirit. He began to prophesy. And the same thing now, here's a very interesting point. The miracles done by Sabbatai and Nathan now begin to spread. When Jews in Poland, Ukraine, Russia, England, France, Belgium, North North Africa, and so on, when they read the letters from Nathan about Sabbatai, and they said, I believe that Sabbatai is the Messiah, there was a false birth. And they were filled with unholy spirits, evil spirits. And the miracles were now multiplied by his followers around the world. And this meant that the movement now took off like a firebrand. Look at today, Pensacola. Toronto, all the other places. Miracles, God TV, spread it. People traveling there, getting hands laid on, go home. They replicate it. Same spirits as Lucifer had. The Jewish people saw a power sign of the Messiah. In order for the American Christians to comprehend the tremendous charismatic power which radiated out of Nathan and laid out of Sabbatai, I want to share the following description by Abraham Conkins of Hebron, in which he described the encounter with Nathan. This is a Jewish man now that described an encounter with Nathan. Everybody went to the prophet in Gaza. And when the turn of Hebron came, I went with a whole holy congregation. When I stood before Nathan, the prophet, all my bones shook, although I had known him before, for his countenance was completely changed. The radiance of his face was like that of a burning torch. The color of his beard was like gold, and his mouth which would not utter even the most ordinary things, I spoke words that made the listeners to tremble. His tongue speak great things, and the ear can hardly take it in. What comes out of his mouth, 
with a wonderful eloquence. And verily, every moment he tells new things, the like of which had not been heard since the day that the law was given on Mount Sinai. That was an eyewitness, and you have that in the book that we're giving you today. I'm just right now just giving you highlights. Now, the flow of letters from Palestine, and they were flowing out. You've got to understand that we had millions of Jewish people living all spread over the world, and there were letters sent out. Not one letter was sent to Gentiles. Only Jews in the different nations were being informed. Gentiles were kept in the dark. According to the teaching of the Kabbalah, only a Jew could be saved and ruled with the Messiah. Gentiles were in the same class as beasts, animals, having no redemptive purposes. On September 5th, 1665, Nathan heard a voice in the Celestial Academy proclaiming that the Messiah, the Son of David, would become manifest to the world in a year and some months. And by September 1665, the news about Sabbatai as a Messiah spread to Yemen in the south to all of North Africa, including Egypt, the capital of Constantinople, Italy, Spain, France, Holland, Germany, England, Poland, Russia, and all nations where Jews lived. Common Jewish people began to speak veiled threats to the native people about the time being at hand when all Gentiles would become slaves to the Jewish people and all Gentiles would lose their properties to them. Compare this now with Jesus. Jesus was rejected by the leadership. They swayed most of the people to reject him. Sabbatai managed to get most rabbis with him. And about 90% of all Jews living at this time were converted to Sabbatai as the Messiah. In 1666, now he had proclaimed that he would simply set up his reign. So early in 1666, he traveled over to, to Constantinople, where he was going to simply tell the sultan, get off your throne, I'm taking over, I am the Messiah. The Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire, at that time was a big world-dominating superpower. And Sabbatai was going to simply start in Turkey and then take the rest of the world. Now the sultan, that's a title, like a king, of the Ottoman Empire was not impressed by Sabbatai. And when Sabbatai and his entourage were coming in with a ship, he was arrested. And they put him in a dungeon where he sat for two months. Now, the Jewish influence in the Ottoman Empire was so strong that they forced the sultan to move him to a better place. And there, for the next six months, Jews from all over the world traveled in to see Sabbatai. The sultan, being a good businessman, said, well, we can let the Jews see him, but there is a cost. And the Jews had lots of money that came down, and they paid. So thousands of Jews ascended the fortress prison and requested to see Sabbatai. He was there with his wife, and he held court with his rabbis. Now, eventually, the sultan realized that either I control the Sabbatai or Sabbatai is going to control me. So he brought him to his court. And he told him this, you have two options. You either convert to Islam, or we're going to execute you right now. Here's Sabbatai now in the court of the sultan in Turkey. And what he did was he took off his hat, spit on it, 
threw it down, took off all his little Jewish things he had, and he simply said, I am now a Muslim. He converted to Islam. The Sultan knew that this guy had some power, political power, and he made him chief of security for his palace in Adonirople. And that's the title that Sabbatai had. When news spread in the world that Sabbatai had converted to Islam, his followers simply dropped. What? Nathan came up and he said, don't worry about this. He said, the Messiah has to pay for your sins. And he has to commit the most horrible crime possible. And that is to renounce his faith in Judaism and become a Muslim, to desecrate himself to the hills. And when he did that, he paid for your sins. The Jews bought it. They said, great. And so as a result, the Jewish people, they want to be close to the Messiah, the Sabbath time, simply said, we are going to do the same sin. In Russia, they became Russian Orthodox. In Europe, they became Protestants. The most prominent of the Protestants later on was Karl Marx. Karl Marx's dad. Karl Marx, the author of communism, his dad was a Jewish rabbi that converted to, if it was not a rabbi, it was a Jew, converting to the Protestant faith. In Spain, they became Catholics. And here's the thing I'm just going to allude to right now. In Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Persia, Iraq, Babylon, the Jews converted in mass to Islam. And the royal Saudi family are descendants. They are actually Jews that are secret Kabbalistic Jews. The current president of Iran, that little ranting fellow, his dad converted from Judaism to Islam. We got a Jewish little fellow sitting in Iran today, running that country. And if you look upon Turkey, most of the leadership in Turkey are Jewish. That's why Turkey and Israel has had such a close alliance. They had a little spat, but they're fixing it up. And so what you have now is Kabbalistic Jews under the guise of being another religion floating to the top, and so what they're doing right now is to create chaos, because without chaos, they cannot take control. Out of chaos comes their order. This is a background of the Kabbalah. Now, all these details, you can read about that in the outline that we have given you. Let me give you very quickly now just a summary here to um, and my time is just about up. I've got too many papers here. This is what I want to go to. The summary of the Sabbatai movement. So you understand that. Sabbatai on page 7 on the outline. Sabbatai is the Messiah of the Jewish people had by now been established in all Jewish settlements around the world. Today they are all over. In the United States they are known as Lubavitchers. Shabbat. You ever heard about Rebbe Schneerson? They went to the White House, saw the president with all his rabbis. They are in Saudi Arabia, Babylon, Persia, Palestine, Turkey, Egypt, North Africa, Yemen, Greece, the Balkan nations, Italy, Spain, France, Holland, England, Germany, Austria, Poland, Lithuania, Russia, they're all over. Let me just mention one name, the Rockefellers. They're not Gentiles. They're good Jewish folks. 
the years ago converted to the Lutheran faith. You can see what they are. Followers of Sabbath tide were sworn to secrecy, taking an oath of death that they would never reveal the truth of who they were or what they believed. Many of them had committed apostasy and converted to whatever religion was dominant in the nation where they lived. Thus they became hidden Jews who would take Gentile names and publicly live like Gentiles, but secretly were followers of the Kabbalah and of Sabbatai. I'm talking about a group of Jews that is hidden from the Jews. By being an international Sabbatai organization with a very strong top governing body, the Antichrist system now had enough power to take on its rival, the Roman Catholic Church. And by the way, we've had at least two or three Jewish popes. And Ignato and Loyola, <coughs> the founder of the Jesuits, was a good Jewish boy, converted to the Catholic faith. As you dig, dig into this, you will see a fabric, and you will say, wow! This is where the NIV comes from. This is where the New Age comes from. This is where this comes from. It all comes back to the Kabbalah. Conclusion. The Kabbalistic Jews realized that in order to take over the world, they needed to establish Jerusalem as its capital and with a Messiah who would rule as the king of Israel and relegate all Gentile slaves. But first they need to build a strong power base to gain control of the world's resources, especially trade and finances, so that no nation or individual could resist them. Mayor Amschel Rothschild spoke the truth more than a hundred years later when he said, give me control of a nation's money, and I care not who makes its laws. Sabbatai, Nathan, and the father are in hell. They are waiting to, or those that have fallen are waiting to die and go to hell. They will all be resurrected, judged in a great white throne judgment, and then cast in the lake of fire, where they will be tormented forever and ever. Closing scripture is going to be Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Here's the good news. We win. Jesus Christ is going to win. In Revelation chapter 20, we read this. In verse number 11, And I saw a great mighty throne, you know, it sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, <coughs> and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whoso was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The good news is this. The Bible is the Word of God. We have the truth. But the loyal followers of the Kabbalah have a deception. Jesus told in the book of Revelation that the loyal followers of the Kabbalah will put an Antichrist on the, on the earth, will have a false prophet in the end times. They will deceive money. You and I now have the responsibility. Number one, study this in detail. Master it so that you can take this information and the Bible and simply say, thus says the Lord God Almighty, this is truth. If you're going to witness to a Mormon, you better know a little bit about the Mormon doctrine. If you're going to witness to Jehovah's Witness, you've got to know what a Jehovah's Witness believe. If you're going to witness to a, a Roman Catholic, you've got to know what the Catholic believe. 
You cannot witness to Kabbalistic Jews and people in that system unless you know what they believe. Now, a lot of people, we are simply saying, well, you know, I don't know if I want to read that. That's too much work, man. I got, I got an effort. You know, man, it's going to hurt my brain. You know, we Christians are so lazy. Satan is using the finest educated people on the earth. Shouldn't you and I rise to the occasion and say, I want to be educated in, first of all, the Word of God, secondly, into the Antichrist doctrine, so that I know what I'm talking about and I can make a difference in the end times. So remember this. It might be bad news today, but the good news is that the bad guys are going to lose, and when they lose, they're going to lose badly. Praise the Lord. Let's stand for prayer. My Heavenly Father, I want to thank you and praise you right now. For these moments that we had here today, Lord. And Father God, this is an ugly message that I put on us today. But Lord, it has to be told because we're coming into some bad times. And I ask you right now, Father God, get people on fire. Let them see they need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. They need to know the Word of God. We need to learn so that, Father God, we can be educated and we can proclaim the truth and not be babbling idiots and saying, I don't know about this or that. Thank you, Father. And Lord, I pray right now, anyone watching me right now that is not saved or listening to me, Father God, let that person simply say, I need Jesus more than ever. And if that's you, and you're simply saying, no, I'm scared, I need Jesus, <clears throat> just ask God to forgive your sins. Ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Repent of your sins and say, Father God, I'm sorry what I've done. Jesus, come on in and be my Lord and Savior. And Jesus will come in. <clears throat> and I thank you, Vatnam, Heavenly Father, that there'll be someone saved today or later on as this will continue to be viewed and viewed and viewed. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The altars are open. If you are here in the church today, you come. If you have the need to be prayed for, whatever it is, the elders are here. We've got plenty of oil. You come and you be prayed for in Jesus' name. You've been listening to Pastor John S. Terrell of Resurrection Life of Jesus Church in Sacramento, California. This message was the fourth part in the series, The World's Money System, and was entitled, The Kabbalah. Sabbatai Sivai lived an immoral life, and the Kabbalah teaches that through his sinful life and death through sickness, he opened the door for salvation for them that believe on him. Striving to live a sinful life is not the nature of God, but of the devil, and the opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Messiah concept found in the Kabbalah is actually Satan's gospel, and the core belief of the people in charge of the coming world government. This message taught the core belief of people in Satan's higher echelons, which also includes the top leadership in Masonic lodges. Once you have grasped and understood this teaching, you will be able to withstand the lies coming from apostate church leaders and the media. Do you have an ear to hear with? This message is available on cassette. CD, and DVD. When ordering, ask for sermon number 1272. There are several ways to contact our ministry. You can visit our website at eaec.org. There you can learn more about Pastor Trail's ministry, read insightful articles, and explore the online store. The web address once again is eaec.org. If you prefer to write, address your envelope to Resurrection Life of Jesus Church, Post Office Box 166, Sheridan, California, 95681. That's Post Office Box 166, Sheridan, California, 95681. If you prefer to call us, the toll-free number in the United States is 
888-708-3232. That's 888-708-3232. For calls from outside the U.S., the number is 916-944-3724. That's 916-944-3724. Resurrection Life of Jesus Church is sponsored by European American Evangelistic Crusades, and this has been a production of EAEC. Thanks for joining us today, and until next time, may God richly bless you as you read your Bible and walk with Him.